Climate Change, Decolonization, and Reconciliation in the Dystopian Novels of Monica Hughes. This presentation is being recorded on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional gathering place for many indigenous peoples. In this place, we honor and respect the history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who call this territory home. Monica Hughes is a British-born Canadian author of both fiction and science fiction for children and young adults. Her books, Hunter in the Dark and The Keeper of the Isis and Light, both won the Canada Council Award for Children's Literature. Today, I wanna to talk about The Crystal Drop, published in 1992, and Ring, uh, Ring Rise, Ring Set, published in 1982. Both of these texts are dystopian texts that feature a, a teenage female protagonist uh, on a coming of age journey. I want to argue that these books by Monica Hughes not only anticipate the climate fiction, uh, the climate change fiction of the 20th century, but that Hughes' uh, dystopian vision of environmental devastation looks forward to both the decolonization of the land and the beginnings of reconciliation with Indigenous communities. Dystopian fiction for children and young adults has become increasingly popular in the first two decades of the 21st century, largely owing to such uh, series as uh, Suzanne Collins' The Hunger Games and James Dashner's The Maze Runner. These texts were um, all uh, made into uh, more than one movie as well. In their introduction to uh, dystopian fiction, dystopian fiction for young adults, brave new teenagers, Balaka Basu, Catherine R. Prott, and Carrie Hintz talk about the inherent pedagogical nature of the dystopian genre. They write, both didacticism and escape have a role to play in the reception an impact of the YA dystopian genre. Together, they speak to the possibility that adolescents can at once fit themselves to better meet society's demand and shape society to better uh, meet their desires and goals. Kay Sambal also points to the uh, pedagogical function of dystopian literature for young adults, but places it in the larger framework of adult dystopias, such as uh, George Orwell's 1984 and Olaf Saxon's Brave New World. She characterizes dystopian writing for children as didactic literature that is both politically and socially motivated with an emphasis on technology in relation to human suffering. In 2008, uh, the journalist Dan Bloom first coined the phrase cli-fi to identify climate change fiction. Climate change fiction is often science fiction, often appears as science fiction or dystopian fiction, but it's not limited to these, uh, to these genres. Climate change fiction can also incorporate narratives of natural disasters and political activism. In an interview with Liverpool University, Bloom comments as for whether cli-fi novels should at least terrifying dystopian visions or promises of hope and optimism based on or in the face of climate change issues, we need both kinds of visions. And individual authors will create cli-fi based on their own considered feelings. This uh, two vision approach seems particularly necessary when it comes to climate change fiction, and especially with respect to uh, young adult uh, books of uh, climate change fiction, such as those by Monica Hughes. According to Manjana Milkerit, imagination is essential not only for understanding and seeing climate change itself, but also for developing promising responses the imagination can help us step away and cast a critical eye towards existing institutions and practices and develop radically different futures. 
when talking about climate change fiction, it's uh, sometimes difficult not to uh, focus on um, on the ruin of the environment solely and to forget about uh, the you know the the very positive things that are being done uh, to help uh, to help the environment to help climate change. Um, here's a uh, photo taken from the NASA website. It's um, an aqua satellite photo of the fires burning in California in September of 2020. But as I said, it's uh, the two vision approach to climate change is always important to keep in mind. Here is the crystal drop by Monica Hughes published in 1992. There's the book cover. The book takes place in Southern Alberta near Fort McLeod. If you're not familiar with uh, Fort McLeod, the Fort McLeod area, here's another photo, uh, which was taken about 10 kilometers outside of Fort McLeod. The Crystal Drop is set in the uh, second decade of the 21st century, so right where we are now. Drought has devastated the prairie landscape, and the book opens with Megan Dougal beside the body of her dead mother, and a uh, stillborn baby. Uh, the father has uh, uh, disappeared several years before, so Megan and her brother Ian are all alone. Megan is determined to take control of what is left of her family and to do something to help herself and her brother. Very few people are left in the area. Uh, farmers and other families have left their homes. Uh, in search of, uh, um, of better places to live. The prairie is drought stricken and water is becoming much harder to find. In an attempt to decide what to do, Megan goes through her mother's things and she finds an old box of uh, letters in a dresser drawer. In going through the letters, she discovers one written to her mother from her uncle. She scanned the letters, stray phrases jumping off the phrase, jumping off the, off the paper and sticking in her head. West of Lumbrook, not far from the falls, we call our new community Gaia after the Greek name for Earth. We, we aim not just to survive, but to help Gaia heal herself. Things are going to get worse, Rosemary. If you and Dawn want to bring the children, you are welcome, 30 of us now. A good crop despite minimal rainfall, I think we'll make it. Megan pockets the letter and before she leaves the house, she takes down uh, the crystal drop, which is an ornament hanging in the window. She takes the thin line that uh, her mother used to hang the crystal drop in the window and she ties it in a loop and hangs the crystal drop around her neck. And then she and her brother leave the farm and start heading towards Lumberg Falls. Megan does her best to act as a surrogate mother to Ian, her younger brother, uh, but Ian tends to be disobedient and intractable, complaining and often drinking too much of the water, uh, the very little water that they have with them. And of course he misses both his mother and his father and he wants to go home. Megan tried to keep her temper we can't go home, Ian. There's nothing there. The well was running dry. You know that. And remember the smoke we saw the day before yesterday from the porc porcupine hills? Well, when I went to pick up our bedrolls, I saw it again, real close to the farm. Now it'll all be burned down. And so we'd be if we'd stayed on. The brother and sister carry on uh, into the west uh, on the 70 kilometer journey to Lumbrick Falls. Megan wears the uh, crystal drop like a talisman, and she keeps thinking about the community of Gaia and the promise of the falls, the promise of a utopian uh, future that she's trying to find for herself and her brother. On their truck west, uh, Megan and Ian encounter encampments of people um, who are set on defending both territory and water. These are the survivalists. They create isolated communities and hoard both water and food. One evening when Megan and Ian find a stream, the first fresh water they found in two days, they stop to bathe and refill their canteens. In the morning, they're met 
uh, with a man, a rifle, and a gun. The brother and sister are driven off by the dog, and Megan is made more aware that this part of the landscape is controlled by the survivalists. The survivalists representing masculine, uh, both masculine, uh, masculine domination and control. According to Iris Ralph, eco-feminist uh, values and the principles that they define refer to cooperation, negotiation, compromise, non-hierarchical hierarchical relationships, sharing, um, empathy, sharing of space and place, listening, dialogue, uh, dialogue, and actively endeavoring to mitigate uh, suffering and violent confrontation. These ecofeminist values and, uh, and principles form a sharp contrast to the male domination that Megan and Ian encounter on their way west. In their next encounter with the survivalists, Megan is shot and it's up to Ian to find help. He's able to uh, locate a small farm run by an old couple, Sadie and Mitch. And Sadie and Mitch bring uh, Megan back to the house and remove the bullet from her side. They're quite happy to share what they have and allow Megan and Ian to stay. But Megan, after she is healed, is uh, driven on by her vision uh, her utopian vision of Gaia that still waits for them near Lumberg Fall. In commenting on dystopian fiction for young adults, Monica Hughes writes uh, that she's guided by the following principle. You may lead a child into the darkness, but you must never turn out the light. She continues, my stories come from my everyday world. Uh, not just my, not just from my everyday world, but from an awareness of the fragility of, of our modern society and the increasingly degraded environment. I test each new idea for its possibilities. And I soon become aware of the tension between these two often contradictory maxims. Dystopian worlds are exciting, but the end result must never be nihilism and despair. Ring rise, ring set. According to Carrie Hintz, in Utopias Written for Young Adults, political and social awakening is almost always combined with a depiction of the personal problems of adolescents. Sometimes an adolescent who feels out of place uh, must attempt social integration within a utopia or dystopia, or an adolescent must negotiate for power or autonomy. While Megan in The Crystal Drop uh, is less politically motivated in her actions, she does see Gaia as a, as a utopian community, which is clearly um, Marxist in nature. This is uh, not quite the same for Liza in Ring Rise, Ring Set. The ring is a band of asteroidal dust encircling the earth, which is causing the climate to change and the glaciers to advance. The city is a science station in Northern Canada in which a group of scientists is doing what it can uh, to battle against the advance of the ice. The science station operates according to a seemingly utopian society. Um, is uh, and, and is one within which families do not exist and genders are clearly divided according to task. Liza Monroe is 15 years old and rebelling against, uh, against the, um, uh, the, the gender divide in the city. This harkens back to uh, Carrie Head's comments on uh, social conformity. Um, after being locked out of, the, uh, out of the city one evening, um, by accident, Lisa, uh, Liza is uh, told to come before Master Bix, who is the leader of the city. After being chastised gently by Master Bix, Liza complains bitterly about the role she's having to perform in the city. Men get to work on the really important things, she says, like how to get rid of the ring and how to stop glaciers growing before they cover the whole earth. 
uh, that's exciting. They talked to radio, talked by radio to the other men who are working on the ring, people from all over the world. They are allow allowed to go on expeditions outside. They are not stuck in the city year after year the way we are. They can go fishing. At the very least, girls should be able to go fishing. After her interview with Master Bix, Liza is determined to escape the city. She devises a plan to stow away on one of the great cargo sleds that are hauled by the skidoos uh, that are being used for the next expedition. Liza gathers some food and the proper clothes uh, for winter on the tundra, and she stows away in one of the cargo sleds. The expedition leaves and travels for 24 hours before it actually stops on the tundra. Liza is planning the whole time to reveal herself once the expedition stops. But what she doesn't realize is the cargo sled in which she has stowed away is actually a fuel supply sled. And it's left alone in the middle of the tundra. By the time Liza manages to escape the cargo sled, she finds herself completely alone in the winter tundra. After almost a full day on the tundra, Liza is rescued by the people, uh, the Ecos, who are the remnant of the Inuit people still living on the land. The Ecos are more than half a myth to the logically minded people uh, of, the, of the science station. Uh, they live on the land and hunt uh, caribou, fish, and migrate uh, from, uh, from one point to another across the tundra. The people believe that Liza is actually uh, a young girl named Ariuk, um, who they believe lost to the spirit world. She joins them as one of their family. And after a winter of living with the people, um, Liza fully identifies as Ariuk and believes that she is one of them. But she also knows that her, um, her place among the people is tenuous. As long as they chose to believe that she was the missing Ariok, as long uh, she, would, she would belong to them as daughter, sister, friend, but no longer. Life goes on with the people until the coming of the black snow, which covers the ground, causing the snow to melt and bringing sickness to the caribou. Liza realizes that the black snow must be something created by the city, by the science station, to, uh, to try and stop the advance of the glaciers. So she determines to return to the city to try and stop them uh, from using the black snow, which will have the inevitable result of destroying the people. Decolonization and reconciliation. Uh, this is a picture of the head smashed in Buffalo Jump, which is uh, uh, located just outside of Fort McLeod in southern Alberta. On their way west and before they encounter the survivalists, uh, Megan and Ian find themselves at head smashed in Buffalo Jump, where they encounter a group of young indigenous men uh, who are living in the abandoned museum beneath the jump. Mike Spotted Eagle, the group's leader, introduces Megan to the stories of Nappy, the trickster figure of the Blackfoot people and the spirit of the buffalo. Mike gives Megan a new way of understanding the destruction of the landscape and the hole in the ozone. Uh, Mike says to Megan, uh, the buffalo, just the beginning, right? Then the rest, rest. Tearing up the land for wheat, so nothing would hold it down when the wind come, draining the good swamp for more land, moving rivers, damming them, chemicals poisoning earth, air, and water, poisoning Napi's good. Megan takes in the stories, and while she's afraid that Mike and his friends won't let them go, finally, Megan and her brother are able to escape um, head smashed in and continue on their journey westward. But Negan takes with her uh, the memory of Mike's stories of Napi, 
and a new way of understanding the landscape. Um, here's a uh, photo of the Canadian tundra. This is actually taken from the Canadian National uh, Canadian Na Canadian Geographic website. Uh, it is a it is the tundra during the summer, not during the winter, though, as you can see. Uh, ring rise, ring set, and reconciliation. In his book, The Inconvenient Indian, Thomas King writes with some skepticism regarding Stephen Harper's 2008 apology to First Nations peoples. Perhaps it was Canada's unwillingness to consider its, uh, the whole of its history with, uh, with Native peoples. Perhaps it was that moment nearly three months later, uh, less than three months after Harper offered his apology, that he stood up in front of the G G20 summit in Philadelphia and announced to the world that Canada had no history of colonialism. In the chapter, What Do Indians Want? King writes, if you're going to talk about Indians in contemporary North America, you, you're going to have to discuss sovereignty, no way around it. In Negan's many discussions with Mike Spotted Eagle, the question of sovereignty never arises, at least not directly. Um, but it does in a slightly different way in Ring Rise, Ring Set. Uh, just as Mike Spotted Eagle retains the stories of Napi and uh, of the Blackfoot, the Ecos retain their own stories about the landscape. The ring for the Ecos, for the people, has become the mouth of Paija, the, uh, the dreadful spirit who stumps the world on one great leg. The black mold or the black snow is the city's answer to the advance of the glaciers. And when Liza returns to the city, she confronts Mr. Biggs, Mr. Master Biggs on its effect on both the people and the landscape. Liza flees the city once again and rejoins the people, but they are all followed by Master Biggs and a number of the scientists from the city. Liza makes the decision to remain with the people. In choosing to remain and uh, to become the wife of Namuni, Liza is clearly uh, aligning herself with both the landscape and the people. Master Bix and the scientists attempt to negotiate with the people, trying to convince Liza to uh, bring them back to the city where they can all live while the scientists deploy the black snow. But Liza refuses. She shook her head. I've already made my choice, Master Bix. I'm staying with the people to remind you of our existence out on the barrens. In the city, it's comfortable in winter when the windows are shuttered. Uh, so comfortable that you might forget about us. Perhaps it'll be a little easier to remember when you know that I'm with the people, hungry when they are hungry, cold when they are cold. Tell my father that. Perhaps he will work a little harder to find an answer. The crystal drop ends with Megan and Ian arriving at Lundbrick Falls and finding the communi community of Gaia. They are welcomed by the community and there they manage to find a much more hopeful future. Ring Rise, Ring Sat simply ends with Master Bix and the scientists returning to the city, leaving Liza with the people and wondering uh, what the uh, what the scientists will do next. While Ring Rise, Ring Set does not end on the same uh, hopeful note as the crystal drop, Hughes manages to avoid uh, nihilism and despair and leaves Liza with the expectation that the city will respond knowing that she's with the people. Given that uh, the Crystal Drop and Ring Rise, Ring Set were published in 1992 and 1982, respectively. I would certainly call Monica Hughes a pioneer of climate change fiction in Canada. Uh, while relying on cultural stereotypes of Indigenous peoples and including the trope of the white savior, both the Crystal Drop and Ring Rise, Ring Set still represent um, young adult 
works of climate change fiction that make some effort to comment and explore the ideas of decolonization and reconciliation with Aboriginal communities. Thank you for listening.